Is recorder on? Yeah, it's on. Recording. Yup. Live feed or? Nah, it's just recording. We let it this out later. Really? Probably not. Fine, let's just get started then. Please state your name for the record. My name is Professor Muhammad bin Hukuk. What is your profession? I am a professor of xenoculture at New Harvard University. Was this your profession during the Teksar Hakara War? No, no, my profession was a orbital drop trooper, sergeant, first Terra Marines. Can you give us an explanation of what your job entailed? We drop in, we fight our way out. You took part in the fighting? Yes. During the assault on Rigel 9, were you with the Marines? Yes, yes I was. Can you describe it for me? Long. Muddy. Bloody. Come on Professor Hukuk, you can do better. You're making a documentary. Actually, we're making a movie. We want it to be as close to reality as possible. From what we've heard, even the folks back at Galactic Studios won't need to embellish much. How much sway do you have with the studio? I'm a senior producer. That didn't answer my question. And white sigh from off camera. I have a lot of influence. I'm pretty much in charge of this production. Then I want your personal assurance that the names and places I tell you won't be changed. These men deserve that and much more besides. You have my word. I want a copy of this transcript immediately after the interview. Fine. Can we please move on to what I came here for? All right, ask away. Professor, tell me about the lead up to and the battle at Rigel 9. As I said, I was with the 1st Marines. Specifically, with 3rd Company, 2nd Battalion. The infamous Riley's Rangers. The very same. Our CO was Captain Hank Riley. Tough old bastard, like a father to every man in that company. Underneath him were the three lieutenants. Jacobs, Stern, and Gibbs. Gibbs was a first lieutenant, second in command of the company. I was transferred to them two weeks before drop. Just enough time to learn the names of the captain and lieutenants, get used to my unit, then suddenly, we're in orbit over Rigel 9, Teksar Hakar world. The first of their original worlds we were invading. Earth was, she gone by that point. Burned by the bugs. Some of the men talked quietly about what their plans were for when they went home. Most considered that bad luck. I was sitting with my squad when Captain Riley gave us his speech. Hold on, I brought a recording of it. A new voice enters the conversation, only the slightest hiss of static mars the audio file. Men, today we're dropping into enemy territory. Real enemy territory. It's fortified and they're waiting for us. We have never dropped onto a world like this before. All Teeks or Hakara are to be considered armed and dangerous until the local hive mind is taken out. That's our job. We're Riley's Rangers for a reason. We drop into the meanest parts of enemy territory to do the most damage. That's what we're doing today. Stick together, work with your squad. You'll come out of this just fine. The voice stops, as does the static. When Marine shock troops drop into enemy-held territory, the CO sometimes plays some heavy metal or hard rock or something to get the men pumped up. It works too, wipes away some of the fear. Just enough so that the men can still function as they strap themselves into what is essentially a big bullet that's going to be fired out of an underpowered railgun directly at the planet surface. Captain Riley always played hardcore. Old song, but damn good. The captain came on, told us he'd see us on the other side. The captain never made it down. Anti-air took out the command pod on the way down. Captain Riley and Lieutenants Jacobs and Stern were wiped. Never even heard a peep. Thankfully, SOP said Gibbs had to be in a different pod, and he was. Lieutenant Gibbs took command. Good man, solid. Exactly the right guy to replace the captain in combat. He got us up, armed and organized, and he did it fast. My squad was on the far left flank with the rest of 1st platoon. Our job was to hold the line and secure an exit line for 2nd platoon, who would be handling the assault on the hive mind. 
is this where things started to go wrong. Things started to go wrong when the goddamn brass decided that they wanted to drop us in the wrong place, at the wrong time, in the middle of the goddamn Teksar Hakara staging ground. Jesus. Damn straight. The first we realize that we're in the middle of another grand cock-up is when 3rd platoon got hit by 50 Teksar Hakara warrior drones. They took 60% casualties in an hour. We were told to reinforce them and dig in while 1st platoon scouted the area. 1st platoon got jumped 200 meters out, every last one of them dead, including Lieutenant Gibbs. Now I'm in command of what we can only reasonably call ourselves an overstrength platoon. And we're smack in the middle of a staging ground for the 3rd Hakkaran Army. We radioed for support, and of course the nearest supporting elements were five clicks away, through the largest concentration of Teksar Hakara on the continent. And we didn't even have a direct line to them, because we were supposed to be linking up with another force, 20 clicks to the north, and our communications were only keyed to orbital command, and transmit a confirmatory ping to other Terran forces. Originally, it was intended to keep us beneath the radar, so to speak to allow us to get close to the hive mind without giving away our position. Instead, what it did was effectively cut us off from the rest of the army. Orbital was too busy to relay our messages for us. I was working with our tech guy, Corporal Swanson, to bypass the block on the radio when the first wave hit us. We knew the Teksar Hakar were out there and we dug in feverishly. We weren't equipped to hold the line against hundreds of enemies, but each soldier had been issued the standard anti-tunneling package. Slam a spike into the bottom of a foxhole, and the SATUFP, Strategic Anti-Tunneling Unit for Fixed Positions, shoots out thousands of nanomite cables throughout the ground, sets them firmly in place, connects them, and runs a million volt current through them. Try and tunnel into the foxhole, and you get an ugly zap. It had forced the bugs to engage us on the surface, and we set up a few some meters in front of our position. It was a good way of encouraging the bastards to come up in front of us. And holy mother of god did they come up in front of us. Hundreds of them came charging out of the forest, no warning, no sound, except the clicking of their legs and their blasts of plasma. We had entrenched defenses, some light plasma machine guns. And the rest of us had laser carbines, plasma grenades, the usual outfit. It was a brutal fight, they kept coming even when they should have been dead. We mowed them down by the dozen, and they swarmed over the bodies of their dead. We started to take casualties as they got closer. Their accuracy isn't very good, but the hive mind keeps them on task, and their sheer weight of numbers often carries the day. It got to hand to hand at one point. They were just coming faster than we could shoot them. Vibro blades and power armor, versus rock hard chitin and mandibles. Four privates were MI after that, just too ripped up to be positively ID'd. Our armor can stop a lot, plasma, lasers, bullets. Knives just bounce off. But bug mandibles have crushing force, the likes of which our suits just can't handle. I was hunkered down with Private Tallman and Corporal Swanson. We're pouring fire into the bugs. Tallman's plasma MG is really what kept them off us. Then they swarmed over their corpses and on top of us. Swanson got ripped apart. Three of them grabbed on and pulled. He was screaming and swearing and shooting to the last, but he died bloody. Tallman lit those three up the second Swanson's vitals went flat. One of them jumped on me. These things are ugly up close. They look like short ants. Two main body pods instead of three, six big legs, six beady eyes, spikes everywhere, a plasma rifle attached to the underside of the head. I stabbed into the eyes with my combat knife. Despite what some idiot riders will tell you, a nanometer edge on your blade just makes it that much easier to break. It doesn't matter if it can slide through titanium. In combat you're not cutting titanium, you're fighting a living being that is going to be moving, and when your edge breaks off, you're dead. I was a sergeant. I had a responsibility to be better than my men. Cleaner, smarter, tougher, meaner, and everything in between. Part of that is having your gear perfectly stashed and equipped. So when I say my knife had a perfect edge on it, not too thin, not too dull, I'm not kidding. I stabbed straight through that bug's eye and into its bug brain. 
and that bastard kept coming. So I shoved my plasma pistol up against its torn up eye and pumped six shots into the brain. It collapsed halfway through cutting my arm off. The connectors to my left arm were shot. My helmet's HUD was flickering in and out and the face plate was cracked. I was bleeding, not a lot, but a little. And the bug had shredded my injury suppressants, so it hurt like hell. Most of my men weren't much better. We couldn't take another wave like that, but moving was damn risky. The way I saw it, the bugs knew we were here. It was only a matter of time until another force came by to wipe my three-quarter strength company off the face of the universe. So we had two options. Stay and die. Or leave and die when we ran into a bigger bug patrol. The men made their voices clear. They were prepared to die. And the way they saw it, they had a better chance of killing more bugs here than they did moving around. So we hunkered down. We piled up bug corpses to use as sandbags. We stripped the bodies of our comrades for parts and ammo. We envied the bastards, actually. I'm sorry. We envied them. By this point in the war. Revival tech. We traded the youngling for it. Standard issue on every fleet ship. Upload your neural patterns, and when your body died, you got a new one, right off the printer. Commercializing DNA sequencing, one thing the 21st century did right. As soon as those bastards were confirmed KIA, they were regrown. An hour later they were safe and sound back up on the ship. Dying isn't fun, I'll tell you that. But there's a certain peace that comes from knowing it isn't final. More likely to throw yourself on a grenade and save your friend. More likely to hold the line against impossible odds or volunteer for a suicide mission. Best thing to ever happen to the human war machine. We hunker down, shore up our defenses, and we kill another group of bugs that wanders by. Fifty-odd insects in that one, all dead. Along with fourteen men. Quarter strength now, about fourteen of us total. We keep doing the same thing. Kill a few bugs, a few of us buy a ticket back up to the ship. It gets to the point where it's just me and Tallman left out of an entire company. But we're surrounded by bug corpses. Must have been two hundred at least. 430. I'm sorry. Official after action report says, at this point it is estimated, your company had killed 430 bugs. Never read it. It was declassified 60 years ago, when Revival Tech went public. Wasn't interested in reading it. Dying isn't fun, and remembering death. It changes you. I'm sorry, please continue. Next wave is about a hundred of the six-legged freaks. They come at us like bats out of hell. Tallman dies quick, plasma to the face. I'm left manning the plasma MG with one hand. It clicks dry, no more charge. I can't change the ammo by myself. It's made to be completely operable by one man, but one man with two working hands. I charge up four plasma grenades, prime them, slap them onto two ammo boxes for the plasma MG, and run full tilt at the bugs. I jump on top of one, and the box blows. Plasma everywhere, burning the hell out of everything and everyone. That's when I died. I wake up on the UHS Washington DC. She was named after the battle in the old Earth capital. Back when she represented the United Statues, I think it was. United States. That makes more sense. Anyways, that was my part in the Battle of Rigel 9. Nothing else. Nope. Nothing about the awards you received. They were after the fact. You received the Medal of Honor for recording the deaths of over 20 men. Without that, they might not have been confirmed KIA and never revived. I did what any man there would have done for me. Thank you, Professor. That's all I have. Don't forget these names, those men that were torn to shreds by the Teeks or Hakara, the ones that were MIA. If you can't be confirmed as KIA, we can't revive you. Having two of the exact same person in the universe, the exact same memories, the exact same fingerprints and DNA. Same loved ones, same bank accounts. What do you tell the one that turns out to have been a POW for 10 years? Sorry, there's another one of you that's been with your family the entire time. No, no, we can't do that. They were permed. Permanently killed. 
permit death, never revived. Privates, Roger P. Ackelman, Reginald Poehler, George H. Kilroy, and Yasa B. Hukik. Any relation? My son. Author's name and the link to original text is in the description. Consider tapping the thumbs up and pressing the subscribe button if you enjoyed this video.